Michael Oskin on the phone with us right now. He's a professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at UC Davis. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And as you've been watching the coverage, you obviously know it was a 6.0 quake that hit at uh, 3.20 this morning. What's your initial assessment? Uh, well, this is an area that uh, there's been a lot of interest in um, in the geology community because we don't understand the faulting that runs up through Napa Valley too well. Um, and uh, so, so I wouldn't say this is entirely a surprise, but it's not an area that we have well characterized. And so people are going out there right now to try and uh, measure the surface rupture, what damage the roads there um, before it disappears. <laughs> the, uh, the road crews are already out there fixing it, as you just mentioned. Uh, Michael, what exactly do they look for in terms of, obviously, there, there's going to be crews looking at all kinds of damage, and they're looking at it from a de very different perspective than, say, the engineers who are out there. What, what, are, what are the teams um, who are specifically looking at the earthquake uh, science? What do they look for? Well, they are, what they're doing, and in fact, I have a couple students that are out there right now um, sending me pictures. I'm actually in Southern California. I can't be out there myself. Mm -hmm. um, they're measuring how much displacement occurred and also providing those locations of where the fault is because we don't know um, this area all that well in terms of what runs through it. This is uh, valuable information. Yeah, you mentioned uh, for the fault. Better to find hazard. You mentioned the fault. Sorry to interrupt you a little bit there. Um, this took place at the West Napa Fault. As I understand, it's near a fault called the Franklin Fault, which has been inactive for 1.6 million years. Um, that's it's in an area between the West Napa Fault and something called the Carneros Fault. Mm -hmm. I don't quite know. I saw the postings about the Franklin Fall, and I haven't gotten to look at a map yet to give you more detail. But what those maps tell you is that it's been active within the last 1.6 million years. And what that really means is that it's active in what we call geologically recent time, but we don't have more information to give it. It's something that, it, that means it's something to be mindful of. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's inactive. So. Um, mm -hmm. with a little bit of incorrect perception. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Michael, we want to bring in our meteorologist, Eileen Javora. Mm -hmm. Hey, Michael, I've got a question for you. Uh, we're talking about the depth of, of uh, earthquakes, this one was about six and a half miles deep or so into the earth. Talk about deeper earthquakes versus shallow earthquakes and how much we feel here on the earth's surface and how much damage we can see. Is this, is this a fairly shallow earthquake that we just experienced in Napa? This is pretty typical for coastal California. Um, it is fairly shallow overall, and when they're shallower, um, they are felt more sharply, so they're more dangerous for their given size. And talk so this about is not abnormal. It's not abnormal. So this is a pretty average kind of standard uh, earthquake in terms of depth. And talk about aftershocks. Typically, when are the most aftershocks felt? As we go forward here, I know the USGS is getting the word out in the next seven days. You know, the next week or so, we could still feel some uh, notable aftershocks. Yeah, there will be a lot in the next few days. It's gradually tapering off. Um, they are one one of the few things about earthquakes that's somewhat predictable is that there's a lot of aftershocks to begin with, and it tapers at a pretty regular pace. So the USGS is posting what they know, um, and just from a a chance perspective, there's always the possibility of an aftershock that is bigger. Uh, than the main one, and that's some, something to be concerned about. Now, the actual epicenter of this uh, earthquake was located in San Pablo Bay. It, it radiated out along the fault there. Um, <laughs> will it, these aftershocks be centered right in the same location, these earthquakes after the, the bigger earthquake, or will it, can it happen anywhere else on the fault line? Do folks up in, say, St. Helena or even over in Sonoma have to be more concerned than, say, folks in Napa? Well, what the aftershocks appear to show is that the fault um, is a northwesterly line, and um, they tend to line up along the part of it that ruptured. And so, those aftershocks are lining up uh, to the north of where the epicenter was. So that probably indicates that the rupture propagated towards Napa right. um, and maybe halted somewhere within the city of Napa or to the south. I mean, that's just part of. The, Going out there looking for the evidence of the surface rupture tells us because um, that seems to be lining up quite well with where the aftershocks are. 
Yeah, up I, north of the epicenter. Right. Are you surprised to see how many cracks uh, we're seeing in the earth? You know, along the roadways, we've seen a lot of cracks. We've also seen them even out towards vineyards, just wide open land. How many cracks we're seeing in the earth around Napa? Um, no, that's a, kind of what we expect. Uh, this uh, earthquake of this size is big enough to produce surface rupture along the fault, and um, those cracks are the motion of one side of the fault relative to the other. It's about um, five or ten inches, what we're finding so far, which is not huge, but not, uh, not unexpected for an earthquake about this size. Yeah. How will you uh, use what you learn from, you know, you said you had students out there, you're going to be really assessing what happened this morning in Napa. How will you use this uh, information from this quake going forward? Uh, well, one way we'll use it is that we really don't know very well where the faults are in the Napa Valley. It's one of the lesser known regions in Northern California. That's so, so surprising, Michael. Oh. <laughs> we have a lot of people living there. <laughs> that's actually part of the problem. It's been yeah. settled so long that you know, there's not a lot of um, access or very detailed mapping has been done. Yeah. So. Okay, so the, the, how many, I mean, in Northern California, specifically in the Bay Area, how many fault lines are we talking? I mean, we know, like, with the Loma Prieta quake, uh, the San Andreas fault, we hear a lot about that, but you're saying that maybe the detail of the fault lines really by scientists is not known all that well. Is this, is this kind of be a trend? Oh, wow, now this quake is, or this fault line is kind of waking up now. Um, well, there is no answer to the how many fault lines question. What we do know is that there are the major systems. And there's, so there's San Andreas, there's um, and then a series of them to the east. And it's been long suspected that one of these runs up Napa Valley is just don't have a lot of information about it on the ground. So that's what getting this information tells us. Um, it also helps delineate where the portion of the fault that did rupture exists. By, by mapping out that surface rupture and could help us understand how it links to faults that didn't rupture to the north and to the south. Right. So help inform future hazard predictions. Okay, interesting. Michael Oskin from UC Davis. UC Davis. Yes, Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. So wonderful to talk to him to so just kind of get that perspective. It's just amazing, you know, how, how little we know mm -hmm. and how much you can actually take from when an actual earthquake happens, how much you can take from it and learn.